everyone, I'm Lisa Walton and welcome to Quilt Stories. Today we're going to be talking to Susie Monday, who does the most incredible work with computers and uses all sorts of different software. Some of it's really easy and I'm sure you're really going to enjoy how Susie manipulates photos and turns them into really gorgeous quilts. So welcome Susie. Hi, thank you. I'm so happy to be here. I really appreciate being part of this august group of quilt stories i i sort of felt when i was watching them uh, the last week or so that uh, i was like well all these people have all these fancy things to say and i just kind of glue my work together and <laughs> keep going so we'll see what i can i can share <laughs> i think i think we all uh, underestimate ourselves really and everyone else is always better than us i think your work's wonderful so i'm really looking forward to learning more about it. The quilt we're going to be talking about is called Our Lady of the Agave. Is it agave, agave? Agave. Is it? Agave. agave. Uh, which is a big cactus, yes? Yes, it's the, it's the big century plant cactus that uh, you see many places around the world that you know, can get to be, oh, five feet tall and then has a bloom stalk of about, oh, 20 feet into the air. So they're really dramatic, wonderful plants. And you're near or in San Antonio in Texas? Yes, I'm, I'm about 40 miles from downtown San Antonio, sort of toward the northwest. But, you know, we're in San Antonio, we're 150 miles from the closest border crossing at uh, Del Rio and really consider, I consider that I live in the borderlands. So a lot of my work is really influenced by the, the plants and the stories and the people and the icons of the region, which this quilt obviously refers to. I spent a week in San Antonio a couple of years ago and it's such a creative and beautiful area. I loved it. I love the river walk and, and just the art is just really wonderful. So here is your full size quilt and it's amazingly colorful and, and looks incredibly complex. So we're going to have a look at where the influence was. So here we have the actual plants and your inspiration. So they look very prickly. Yes, and, and I have a huge collection of cactus and agave photos. And so that when, I, when I go to make something like this, I'll look through the ones that I have, although I, I have quite a few that I've already designed fabric with. So I'll you know, call on those. And this piece, you, you said you wanted things to see all the different steps. And I'm so bad at taking photos that I said, well, I just have to do it with this current quilt that I'm working on. <laughs> no, I like to take photos as I'm working because it reminds me of the techniques. Uh, is it's that snow idea. on the cactus I can see? Yes, that's snow. So even, even when we get our very rare snowfalls, you will have these wonderful pictures of images you can collect of the of the, that's a prickly pear and they turn this great purple color when they're exposed to cold weather. This is a photo that you started using um, before you started manipulating it. So which program are you using for this? Well, I just took the photo and I did a little bit of basic photo editing. And then on the right, it shows a program called Emma Engine. It's like Imagine, but Imagine Engine. It's a, it's a really interesting program that I still haven't figured out all its possibilities, but you can <laughs> choose the, the little symbols along the bottom are different already fixed special effects. And then you can adjust each of those special effects with the slider bars or the color palettes or things like that. So generally when I start working on designing fabric, which is, I, I do all of these things in, not in, in a intentional, direction. Design fabric, I surface design fabric, I make fabric like this and send it off to be digitally printed, but I don't even know what I'm going to use it for at that time. <laughs> Is that a, it's just an iOS app? Yes, it's an app. I, I basically use my iPad for all my design work. I'm kind of a Photoshop dropout. I try, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I just, it's like I wasn't using it enough to really master the tools. And then I found that on my iPad, if I bought these little apps, suddenly I just had to remember what each app did. I didn't have to remember a bunch of sequ sequences and layers and steps like that. So 
uh, using an iPad is really a very, um, I'd say it's kind of a cheater's way to work <laughs> with Photoshop. Not at all. But the not developers. At all. I, yeah. I like that term of Photoshop dropout because uh, it's quite expensive and it's far more cleverer than I am. And I think I use about two features on it. So um, right. maybe I need to be a dropout as well. Well, that's why I teach my class. <laughs> Indeed. This is a, one of your quilts that, uh, or is it part of the original? This quilt is uh, the first one I did with that particular image and with that fabric. So I sent the fabric off, had it printed, got it back. And then as I do with all of my quilts, I, I don't just stick with kind of the whole cloth. I, I add on to them with other fabrics and other design elements. So this was number one in a whole series. And here are some more kind of alterations with other different apps that you can see. Just, just, I just play around with these at night. You know, it's kind of what I do instead of Facebook sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> do you get lost? I get lost sometimes when I go into these apps and I, I forget, I just keep hitting the save button, I think. Yeah, and that's why I have 23,000 photos. So <laughs> you, that it's would do okay. it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, I try to put them in, in, in file folders in uh, on my computer but I'm not always very successful. I'm looking at the bottom photo and I can sort of see some of the previous ones but there are some that just look like drawings as well so you you draw over your images as well? Uh, the drawing is all done on the iPad so those drawings are actually in the fabric or part of the fabric so okay. like the the kind of wind motion on the left in that uh, it's kind of a big prickly pear. This was just kind of, I, I found this photo on my dis, of my design wall when I would had put a bunch of big bend kind of related pieces up because I had a collector who was interested in looking at several. <laughs> so that was good. That's a great, great problem to have. Yes. <laughs> so you use spoon flour. I do. I use spoon flour mostly. Every once in a while I'll use uh, a, a UK a company called Contrado, and they have a lot of other fabric choices. And Spoonflower no longer sells silk. So if I want to get something on silk, then I have to uh, go with Contrado, which is a lot more expensive, but they do really beautiful fabric printing. And are your fabrics also available for sale on Spoonflower? No, I don't have them for sale right now. And partially that's because Spoonflower basically has a standard kind of markup. and I kind of figured my images are my main, <laughs> my main uh, creative ownership and that I, d I don't really want to sell them for $15 a yard. So I'll, okay. I'll keep them and I'll sell them. Some, sometimes I have li links that I sell at quilt shows and, you know, fair booths and things like that. So when you order your uh, designs on Spoonflower, I can see that it says you ordered two yards. So do you, order duplicates or do you just get one off? So, Well, the, if you'll look, you can kind of see that the size of this photo, when it's 40 inches wide, which it has, which I put on to fit in a 42 inch piece of fabric, it, it's more than 36 inches. So if I just ordered by a yard of the fabric, it would cut off part of the image. So I'm kind of stuck with always ordering you know, whatever I need to, to get that full image. And it's actually pretty nice because then I have extra fabric that if I need to piece something in or I use it on another kind of, a lot of the pieces on this current quilt, the Our Lady of Agave were sort of these cut off edges. And mm -hmm. I just, uh, cause I save every scrap of my custom designed fabric. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> so we have obviously from two different years, of the similar theme, is that correct? Yes, and I, I wanted to show this because this piece actually, Our Lady of the Agave, it kind of combines two of my series work. One of them is a series of these kind of iconic takeoffs from Our Lady of Guadalupe or iconic kind of powerful women goddesses and symbols and uh, virgins. And then the other are these series of the agave. So, it, I've got these two series that I kind of come back and forth from. And I also then work a lot in some more recently in abstract pieces. So 
I always work from a series, but I've got three or four different series going. And you can see the similarity with the, the Guatemalan, uh, I mean, the Mexican and Guatemalan uh, wheat peel embroidery. I cut those up from pieces I find in thrift stores. And you're wearing a lovely one as well, which... Um... Yes. <laughs> Someday it too will probably be cut up. <laughs> but I started finding these and they're getting harder and harder to find in thrift stores these days. I think that the really beautifully embroidered ones are just becoming a thing of the past. But these are all from uh, the Mexican highlands, sort of southern area around Oaxaca. I, I pretty much cut up any kind of fabric and use it in my quilts. I'm not a purist by any means. I mean, there's silk, there's <laughs> cotton, there's linen, there's velvet, there's bits of lace. It's, you know, whatever serves the design. I, I love the additional texture that these add to any work, really. I love texture in quilts. So I can imagine they would be, you'd really want to be touching them. <laughs> <laughs> So here's, you know, kind of a start. I'll start with just a stack of fabric. So I've pulled out, you know, some of the ones that uh, ended up being used in this, in this particular quilt. And you can see another piece of spoon flower fabric that was actually done from a sketch. So sometimes ah. I'll take, do sketches and run them through filters and end up with uh, designs that aren't really photographic, but kind of still have a sense of realism to them. That's a beautiful fabric there. I just, I'm sort of looking at and coveting it. And then I start, I, I, I start my process working on a big design table. I have a, uh, let's see, six foot by eight foot design table. Ooh, so nice. I can really put the whole, you know, unless I'm looking bigger than an eight foot long length, which occasionally I am, I, I can just start by, uh, you know, working on sections of these. And, and because I, as I've gotten older, it's getting harder for me to kind of work things through the sewing machine. So I tend to uh, work in sections and then uh, piece and applique the sections. This is, uh, this particular quilt was done in three sections and then I, you know, stitched it all back together. Okay. But I have to sort of think about how those edges are gonna go together. So they're all raw edge applique? It's all raw, raw edge, fused, free motion, and hand stitch. Right. It's okay. all ironed. It's all ironed on. You mentioned you have a design table, not a design wall. Well, I have a design wall too, but I don't really use it for this stage. It's like later I'll put it up on the wall and look at it and see if it needs additions. And you'll see that later in the slideshow. My initial work is always just flat, working on it flat. So this is just layering yeah. of your applique. And you can see kind of the three sections of it, layout of it. And you can see it's on the big long end of the table. So fused and then um, hand and machine stitched. Right, hand and machine stitched. And I don't even worry too much about what order they go in. So sometimes I'll do a lot of machine stitching and then take it out and work on it by, oh. um, by hand. And then I'll take it back to the machine. So, you know, it's, it's kind of back and forth. That's interesting because I don't do hand stitching, but because I'm dreadful at it and arthritic hands, but I thought most people actually did it at the end. You've changed my thoughts on that. So, yeah. yeah. And I kind of like the way it looks when you stitch over a bit of hand stitching too, because I, most of my hand stitching, believe me, it's not fine embroidery. You can tell it is big stab stitches and uh, I, I use it as kind of a, a design element to add this kind of fizzle of energy. It's, it's getting very popular now, having a combination of machine and, and hand stitch. It used to sort of be one or the other, but now I'm noticing there's a lot more of it. And again, it's just another layer of texture, isn't it? It's beautiful. Yes, yes. and that's what I'm after. Here's, here I am doing, and I use these really long, thin needles, which I cannot find anymore. So I'm really upset because I think I'm on my, they bend easily and I think I'm, and they're easy to lose. So I think I'm on my last package. So I've got to start doing another internet search because the company that used to make them, I'd order them from England and uh, they don't make them anymore. So Would they be straw needles? Uh, maybe that's what they're called. I don't, I, I don't even know what they're, these were like gold tip quilt basting needles. Okay. But they were three inches long. Check out straw needles. You okay. might find that that's what they I'm are. Kind of and for. you can Good. still get them 
So here's a nice combination of the hand stitching and the, and the machine quilting. This is when I put it up on the wall. So the one on the far left, you can see I'm starting to play with how do I want to integrate these three areas if they need to overlap more. And I, I realized that I needed an element that went from the middle section down through the moon at the bottom to tie it all together. So this, this is just shows you that kind of process of once, it on, once it's on the wall, then I can uh, play around with what I need to do to make it uh, all come together. It's quite different looking at things flat to looking at on the wall, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> I tend to work flat because my design wall sort of covered my sewing machine, so I find it hard to get to them. <laughs> and then I put it up on the design wall. It's like, oh, oh dear, I wish I hadn't done that. But, <laughs> right. Um, yeah, it's quite interesting. So you've just tied this together with more of those leaves, yes. leaf shape. Yeah, yeah the kind of leaf, and it, leaf vine. And it really shapes. works too. What's happening here? Well, I am actually at this point now, I have to make it square it off. <laughs> so I use a T-square and a big tape measure. And I've never quite figured out how to make everything straight in the first place. So it usually takes some uh, fiddling around with it. And like where those two, you know, the three sections are going to go together. I've got to mm -hmm. figure out, you know, where's the batting going to be and what's going to lap over what. and I'm going to fuse that and engineer those little, you know, I intentionally leave pieces that will overlap so I don't end up with just a bunch of horizontal lines in the, in the quilt. And here's your studio. Or here's part my of your studio. studio. Relatively neat, at least from this angle. That piece on the wall, and you can see another big woman piece up on the side. So I, I pretty much can, you know, I'll use just almost any technique. Yes, I'm just, um, I'm looking at your uh, Benina, which is um, quite a few years old, I suspect. Oh, yes, it's, quite a few it's stitches. An, an Artista 185, and my sewing machine repair shop and sew, sewing center says, never get rid of this machine. It's got like millions of stitches on it. It was a gift to me. Somebody wow. retired yes. from quilting and gave it to me about maybe five, eight years ago or so. And so I, uh, I actually had another Bernina. I've been really gifted with Berninas and not from the company. They, they uh, I, for some reason, people say, would you like my old Bernina? And I say, yes. Yes. So, <laughs> and it's I did buy, a, a, buy that brother uh, straight stitch machine. And I, I, I have to confess that I haven't used it enough to get very proficient. And I, anyway, this is the office, which is in another part of the, the house that the studio is actually in a little outbuilding, which where we also have an uh, Airbnb. And then mm -hmm. Linda and I share this office space. And um, we have our big Macs back to back where we can talk to each other. <laughs> Yeah, I've got one of them. That's what I'm looking at now. I, I love my Macs. I'm a bit of an Isn't Apple fan. fabulous? <laughs> They're such great mach machines. Yes. Wow. And this is looking out the back door and the back porch. And that's another space I like to work in. So if I'm stitching or something, I'll, you know, I'll bring a podcast out and sit around the table and watch the, the hills come alive and change. It's like an, a giant widescreen movie every day <laughs> oh that would be amazing yes absolutely beautiful yes you could sleep out there too could you yep yep we could sleep out there although you know there's a lot of things that make noise at night <laughs> <So> <laughs> i'm really better in a quieter room <laughs> oh dear that it just looks looks really magnificent so here are all susie's links and i will also have them included below in the description. I'd really like you just to tell us a little bit more about your classes because I was at a presentation that you did at the SACWA conference in San Antonio and I was fascinated and so uh, I think it'd be really interesting if you just told everybody a little bit more about the classes that you offer. I'd love to. I, uh, I teach three classes right now that are completely online courses so they're they're not there you sign up for a session that starts they most of them are i think six weeks long 
and each week there's a set of lessons that has maybe 10 activities in them. So very, very comprehensive. And the first one's called Art on the iPad, and it's for people that are just, well, anybody that wants to move from just using their iPad for uh, Facebook and Kindle and <laughs> reading and sending emails to actually using it as an art making tool because I, I probably surveyed 200 apps a year to find the best ones. Wow. So in these courses, I'll recommend and I'll have tutorials for probably every week, there's at least eight to 10 apps. And some are covered in real detail and others not. And then I go through the process of how to use Spoonflower and print on demand products and things like that. And I teach maybe two or three sessions a year of art on the iPad. It, it's kind of the basic class. And then I teach another one that's more intermediate level called collage on the iPad. And it's more about layering images and how to put, you know, photographically to develop these uh, more complex kind of layered images using, again, just apps. And I did a new class that is just finishing up called Text on Textiles, which is all about using words and ways that you can use words and letters and letter forms in your work, both abstractly and in very literal kind of, you know, poster-like ways. So that's been really fun to do. And, and with all my classes, I kind of have a concept and I have a bunch of materials that I've used in, you know, in-person classes and I start putting them together. And then the people that take the first class, they get to see me work in <laughs> my work in progress because I keep adding to it and taking another thing and say, oh, wait, this would be a good resource. So it's a, it's a learning process. Even the sessions I do in Art on the iPad, for example, but I have a lot of people that come and take that class like three and four times. So it almost becomes more like a club. I mean, we, we have a lot of good companions and discussion and companionship and people posting all kinds of interesting images. So it's been, it's really been a treat because I've gotten to know a lot of quilt artists who've taken my class and I kind of consider them co-teachers at this point. <laughs> That's been really interesting. I love to see progress shots of quilts and especially finding out a little bit more about how they're made, your thought processes, and it's been really interesting. So I'd like to thank you very much. And I think I need to sign up for one of your classes. <laughs> and, well, and I think you'd enjoy it. I'd love to have you. <laughs> just to get away from trying to work out how to, how to do Photoshop because it's just definitely not my thing. I hope everyone has enjoyed this and learned a little bit more about uh, creating your own images uh, using apps and also a bit, a bit more about collage. And if you have enjoyed this video, please click on the subscribe button just down there. And um, I hope that you will do that and also do a thumbs up because that's what YouTube likes to see. And that way my videos get spread far and wide. So thank you, Susie, and it's been great to chat and thank bye you. for now. Bye. bye. See you soon.